I am inside the Notre Dame Cathedral. This place is renowned for its Gothic architecture and iconic acoustics. Except the real cathedral was devastated by a fire in 2019 and I'm actually in a sound studio at Sorbonne University about a kilometre away. The audio is being fed through a computer program to accurately represent what it would actually sound like if I were standing in the pre-fire cathedral. In today's episode, we'll be finding out how this program works, how it's being used to renovate the real cathedral, and we'll learn a bit more about our musical heritage. If you're trying to simulate the real world inside a computer, then the best place to begin is the real world. This is the actual Notre Dame Cathedral, undergoing some pretty serious repairs at the moment, but still very much at the heart of Paris. Despite having roughly the same musical talent as a sack of potatoes, even I can appreciate how much better things sound when you bring them from being performed out in the open to inside Notre Dame. In 2020, a year and a half after the fire, a small group of performers were allowed inside for a televised Christmas concert. They were devastated to find out that the building's acoustics had changed, somehow becoming deadened. With a quintessentially French reverence for history, musicians demanded that the repaired Notre Dame was to sound identical to the one before the fire. For that, we need to understand why cathedrals sound the way that they do. This is the Pastilia of St. Denis. The original Denis was a third century Roman bishop who was sent to Paris to help convert the local tribes to Christianity. According to legend, he was decapitated at Montmartre, where after apparently dying, his decapitated corpse picked up the head and walked it some 20 kilometers before deciding to die properly at this location. The cathedral was eventually constructed here in his honor. When we talk about acoustics, what we really mean is reverberation or reverb. By filling up this balloon with air and then popping it, we should release an impulse of sound. By listening to it, we can quantitatively determine how much reverb the space has. If we pop it outside, no reverb. Let's compare that to in a bathroom, a metro station, and of course, here in the cathedral. Sound is just a series of pressure waves. When these hit an object, some of the wave energy bounces back and some gets absorbed. The returning energy can then bounce off objects again and again and again, until eventually all of the energy is lost. We hear these progressively fainter returns as reverberation. In a bigger space where reflective surfaces are far apart, this means that it takes longer for reverberation to fade away. Breaking up our recordings by frequency, you can see how lower frequencies persist longer than higher ones. This is what gives reverberation its iconic roll-off sound. With the help of a robot, this same balloon burst test was performed in the post-fire cathedral. Compared with historic data, reverberation time was significantly shorter, especially for the low frequencies. We could fix Notre Dame by just making it bigger but given the truly ridiculous land prices in Paris and the fact that different frequencies were affected by different amounts, this wouldn't solve the problem very effectively. Instead, we need to look for other approaches. When we drop a ball onto a hard material such as stone, then it returns to pretty much the point we dropped it from. That's because very little of the energy is lost in the bounce. On the other hand, if we drop it onto a soft material like a jacket or a person, then much less of this energy is returned. In much the same way, sound waves bouncing off of hard materials have most energy come back to them, allowing for many, many reverberations to occur. Adding in a whole lot of stone increases reverberation time for Notre Dame. But to fine tune it for different frequencies, we'll also need to add some extra approaches. This is Saint Chapelle, originally constructed to house relics from the Holy Cross, the Crown of Thorns, 
sacred sponge, and of course, the holy hand grenade of Antioch. These massive, 15 meter tall stained glass windows show stories from the Bible as these relics were created and eventually moved to Paris. As these relics were moved away, people noticed that the sounds inside the space started to change. Windows have no effect on high frequencies, which bounce off of them as if they were made of stone. But lower frequencies cause the panels to bow like a membrane, absorbing a good chunk of their energy. Likewise, rougher surfaces like unpolished stone, ancient relics, and really cool detailing don't affect low frequencies, but will scatter higher ones due to lots of very small crevasses. Depending on the ratio of relics to glass, we should be able to fine tune many of the building's high and low reverberant frequencies. Our final factor to consider is structure, and it's what brings us to the top of Montmartre. Coincidentally, this is where Saint Denis was beheaded, before walking all that way to the Balloon Cathedral from before. Now, not wanting to miss a perfectly good opportunity to give Paris yet another cathedral, eventually people built this, the Sacre Coeur Basilica. Its prime location makes it clearly visible from the rest of Paris, where its domes, more similar to those of a Russian Orthodox cathedral than anything else here, are very clearly visible. These have an interesting acoustic effect, where they're able to capture a lot of the reverberation, before only later reflecting it back down into the audience. This gives the impression as if the angels in heaven are singing. It's a cool effect, and would definitely add to reverberation time, but probably isn't quite what we're going for with Notre Dame. Columns stop the roof from caving in, but also affect how sound operates. High frequencies are able to bounce off the columns, while lower frequencies effectively pass straight through. Depending on where you're seated, this means that different frequencies will reach you at different times. Interconnected chapels, crypts, and corridors will also change how sound flows through the structure. Understanding how all these factors interconnect is actually pretty complicated. Just moving one thing will change the entire acoustics. Therefore, in order to properly understand how Notre Dame is going to sound, we can't just make the renovations, we've got to simulate them first. And to do that, we'll be heading back down the hill to Sorbonne University. It turns out that you can simulate sound in much the same way as you might do a high-end light simulation. We model sound as a series of particles, which emanate from the source. Like with actual sound waves, when these particles hit an object, they bounce off, losing some energy as defined by what material we're hitting. By replicating the building in 3D space, populating it with materials, and then placing in some virtual microphones before running the simulation, we can replicate what being at those microphone locations would actually sound like. At the moment, we have the fire destroyed cathedral and a very accurate calibrated simulation of that same fire destroyed structure. Engineers use this model to find out which additions or substitutions are required to match the recordings made in the pre-fire Notre Dame. In the early days, when there were some pretty outlandish rebuild proposals, this simulation would have been used to suggest design alterations to ensure that the new acoustics match those of the original, even if appearances did not. Want a lot of glass? Fine. But since that will dampen the low frequencies, we'll have to have some extra ancient relics for rounding out the high ones. That is, extra of the ancient relics, not an extra old handkerchief from St. Denis. Today, the architectural mission is to bring things looking like they were before, which makes the acoustics loads easier. Even so, the materials and decorative items that are physically available, as well as the new ways which people are planned to walk through the space, will fundamentally change the acoustics. To counteract us, we can add in more stone, put in some carpet, perform a blood sacrifice, knock out a wall to replace with glass, and just move around some seats. Of course, making these alterations in the digital simulation first, before doing it for real. While it will take at least another two years to open Notre Dame to real performances, for the moment, the tools we use to renovate the cathedral can be jury-rigged to give a virtual reality performance acoustically identical to the real thing. When you bring all of that together, 
you get this, the Ghost Orchestra of Notre Dame. It was made by recording individual groups of musicians and then simulating them inside a computer. This is incredible. When I watched it for the first time, it felt as if someone had put a drone inside their real Notre Dame and then just flown it through holding a microphone. I had to keep reminding myself that all the reverb was simulated. Graphics though? Yep, I can tell they're fake. As we continue to restore this mighty cathedral, it is the simulations like those made at Sorbonne University which will guide our acoustical restoration of this incredible monument. The Ghost Orchestra of Notre Dame will be ghosts no more. This has been James Dingley from Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up.